Without further ado, because we have a lot of material to be covered, I'm going to introduce our moderator for this morning, Dr. Jeff Ponsky. Hello. Thank you for giving me a podium that's too large for me. Um, I'm delighted to be here and a part of this presentation. want to get on with this. Uh, let me say that uh, in case any of you were thinking, why are we doing gastroenterology? We're doing surgical endoscopy and gastroenterology, and it's all the same these days. And so we're delighted to have our presenters today from Cleveland Clinic, Florida. And the first fellow who's going to present is Dr. Louis Lara, who uh, is doing some very innovative things and things we need to be doing in the area of diverticula of both the colon and of the esophagus. So, Louis, come on up. Good morning, Dr. Wexner, Dr. Ponsky. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'm going to be, uh, let me open the uh, presentation here. Um, let me start off with a case. Maybe I can open up a little bit of discussion, and then I'll um, I have a video, and uh, I'll uh, be describing the uh, endoscopic approach uh, for the, uh, these particular patients. Uh, this is a 72-year-old male with progressive dysphagia, solids and then liquids with mild weight loss, food regurgitation, and feeling of gurgling in the neck after eating. Um, he had an open cricopharyngeal myotomy a few months back, uh, but unfortunately, just a few months later, he has a recurrence of the same symptoms, and this is his uh, barium swallow. And um, this, uh, I think, is pretty obvious that uh, he has a recurrence of the diverticulum. It's a moderate size. Uh, but he is quite symptomatic with this, so I wanted to discuss what options were available for this person. So, uh, any comments from out there in the, uh, in the uh, peanut gallery? Anybody want to tell me what they would like to do for this? Uh, certainly the traditional approach has been a left neck approach, hasn't it been? Mm -hmm. An open left neck approach, and I think the principle of uh, diverticular treatment uh, for uh, this diverticulum is not removal of the diverticulum, but the cricopharyngeal myotomy. Absolutely. Traditionally, this has been treated clearly by the ENT surgeons, hasn't it? Yes. And this has been a disease where they have gone in traditionally through a left neck incision. Mm -hmm. I don't want to steal your thunder, but I think that other people have shown over the years, and, and uh, I have visited Chile where Claudio Navarrete has done a huge series of these endoscopically. And Todd Barron from Mayo Clinic has challenged us in a recent issue of gastrointestinal endoscopy actually about a year ago, why aren't we doing more? And now that we're doing POEM, where we're treating achalasia, this is just achalasia of the upper esophagus. I guess it? you would call it like that. Yeah. So, Lewis, take us. Let's All right. So, uh, very briefly, uh, I'm not going to spend time on this, but there's a diverticulum, a pseudodiverticulum, as many in the body, they don't really have a muscle layer. And uh, it's a protrusion through Killian's triangle, the inferior pharyngeal constrictor, of course, consisting of the thyropharyngeal and the cricopharyngeal. And um, as uh, Zenker described in 1877, everybody believes this. It's a force with an lumen acting against a restriction. Actually, studies have shown that the anterior-posterior pressure is much higher, less, at least about twice higher than the, than the lateral pressures in this area. And it is a dysfunction of swallowing. So there is a problem with a discoordination of the upper esophageal sphincter relaxation plus the pharyngeal swallowing mechanism itself leading to the diverticulum we see here. So as Dr. Ponsky already mentioned, really, if you don't cut the muscle, you don't treat the disease. Thus, previous surgeries where they actually resected the diverticulum or did di di diverticulopexies or even inversions don't work unless you cut the muscle. Thus, um, subsequent ENTs uh, certainly have, uh, have uh, led the charge here treating this disease with rigid endoscopy. Lasers were used and appear to have actually worked well, but now endostaplers are the method of choice. And, of course, flexible endoscopy that I'm going to be discussing. This is the goal of treatment. You have a diverticulum, the lumen. You want to cut it so the diverticulum empties. And, and look at uh, in this cartoon. You can see what the, what the goal of therapy is to cut this and thus uh, lead to drainage of the diverticulum freely, drain uh, uh, food, water into the esophagus without resistance. Very quick review because I'm going to discuss some of these uh, tools that we're going to be using in the next video, but uh, this is what's available in the United States. I know in the uh, world there are other apparatuses, but uh, basically uh, needle knives um, with different um, tips that allow us to cut and burn. This one has a covered ceramic tip so you don't burn beyond where you want to. There's a hook and the dual knife. This one actually sticks out a little bit even when it's uh, fully closed, and that's one of the ones I'm going to be using. So um, in this first video, 
Um, we described this a few years um, ago, actually in 2008, uh, and published in Gastroendo. And you can see right here, this is an untouched uh, diverticulum. Uh, we always pass an NG tube. You want to leave an NG tube there. It helps you identify the site. Uh, it also serves a little bit of safety for when you're manipulating the instruments. And this is something that some people do, but few, uh, fewer people are doing now, which is applying a clip. We were using a Johnson & Johnson clip here. This is a very nice clip mechanism. It actually had four clips uh, you could apply at the same time. These were very strong clips, unlike the clips we have right now. If anybody's ever shot one on their finger, you'll, you'll know that they're not very strong. These were very strong. And as you can see right here, we're using the clips on both sides to kind of separate the plane, if you wish. And uh, here we're just using a needle knife. Note the absence of a cap, which uh, right now would, would probably not be appropriate. And uh, here we go and uh, just start cutting away. How much do you cut? We discussed this with Dr. Ponsky yesterday, and that's kind of our best guess. We try to make it as flat as possible. That's really the answer. If you want to get technical, maybe half a centimeter uh, um, above uh, the, uh, the, the depth of the diverticulum is where you should go at most, because obviously you don't want a perforation in this area. That could be uh, uh, very difficult to treat. And uh, a typical settings, actually just DRCP settings. In the next uh, video, I'll, I'll discuss that a little bit more. And uh, here, you're just moving it away. As it turns out, I actually think the clips hinder your, uh, your movement a little bit. Maybe they create some safety barrier, but that's definitely questionable. There are a couple of case series regarding the use of clips, and whether they make a difference or not is, is really not, not clear to us. So that's, um, that's how it looks afterwards. You see how it's flat. This person actually uh, immediately uh, uh, went home. I just want to show you a couple of pictures. This is the patient uh, that we briefly presented, that I just briefly presented, who actually had surgery already. As you can see right here, the anatomy is not the same. Actually, you look how the, uh, the fibers actually will bleak to the plane. I already put an NG tube. Uh, and actually, a second diverticulum has occurred kind of next to the first one, and you start seeing some clips, and you see how thin the wall of the diverticulum actually is. I'm not going to cut this. I'm going to focus down here where the cricopharyngeal actually is. That's how we cut it with a cap, and that's how it looks. We're presenting this actually at, at the American College of Gastroenterology meeting in the next uh, few months. Uh, but... Um, as I already discussed, that's the x-ray image. Of course, the diverticulum occur, first of all, in older males, usually in the 60s, 80s, uh, and um, uh, with, the with the dysphagia I already mentioned. We do the procedure under general anesthesia, even though many centers do not, and we initially didn't at the institution I was at. This is how that diverticulum initially looked. As you can see, it looks very nice, but once you start manipulating, and we use a cap, of course, but once you start manipulating the area, the anatomy certainly changes when the uh, uh, endotracheal tube is there and when the NG tube is there. We pass the NG tube under direct vision. You don't want to pass it blindly, obviously. You may have to use a guide wire to do this. Note the clips from the previous surgery up here. And uh, here we go. The NG tube is now in place. And unfortunately here, I have an oblique plane, so I'm going to have to find a way to actually cut this appropriately and, uh, and as safe as possible. And this is the second little pseudo-diverticulum, I guess, that I would call this that I'm not going to really, uh, I'm going to try to avoid. Um, and here I am actually using the, uh, the, um, um, the, the Olympus um, uh, device that's, that's going to mark the spot first, um, just using a, a, a regular soft coag mode. Um, and... You're going to see it here. The, a little bit of the tip comes out in this device, which is quite helpful. That's the dual knife. And you actually may see uh, the muscle uh, moving a little bit as we cut. And, of course, now the, the site has been marked. I don't inject. I think it's unnecessary to do so. These things actually remarkably don't bleed hardly anything, really. And, uh, and then you start cutting. How do you cut? Try to maybe start away from the diverticulum. Uh, you do have the NG tube there to serve as, a, as kind of a safety barrier so you don't hopefully go beyond but you're going to go back and forth, back and forth, and uh, the position of the scope is going to be guided by what seems to work at the moment. You notice we have a cap. Uh, I think that's very important. It certainly exposes the area, and the cap can actually be used a little bit for dissection. It's just being seen right here. I've changed the, this to uh, the triangle tip um, uh, device now that's uh, being used to cut uh, and uh, get in deeper. You actually see a little bit of contraction of the muscle as uh, we're cutting through. And I'll go back and forth with this. And now I'm using the uh, ceramic tip coated one so I can go a little deeper. Remember, this patient has already been treated, so there's some scar tissue here, and you can actually feel that as we're cutting through. Very carefully towards the diverticulum. I, again, use the dual knife because it's smaller. Uh, I think it gives me a little bit more control. 
to just kind of finish it off and try to flatten the diverticulum as much as I can. Uh, note again the minimal amount of, uh, of bleeding that is um, occurring in this, in this procedure. And that's the, uh, pretty much the end result. So um, what are the procedure results? What do we know a little bit from the literature? Well, this is uh, data from Spain and a small number of patients, and most of these are just case series, really. But if you, as you can see right here, these were endoscopic, uh, rigid endoscopes, CO2 or stapling, and cervicotomies. Procedure times, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the time to resume uh, PO and the length of hospitalization, they were from 5 to 11 days, which seems kind of uh, a lot. And actually, um, if you look at uh, data actually from uh, many uh, other centers that was pulled in this uh, interesting study, uh, you, see, you see that the open takes about 36 minutes, rigid 16 minutes, flexible 23 minutes. Um, pretty good success rate for all. Recurrence rates are about the same. Morbidity is about the same. Perforations apparently is zero with a rigid, but who knows, right? And 4% convert to open. I think the perforation leak rate of about 5% is probably real, true, and something that I quote to my patients before we do this procedure. Basically, in conclusion for this, the goal of treatment is clearance of bolus from the pouch. That's what you're trying to do. Keep in mind, these patients have an abnormality of swallowing, so I'm not telling patients you're going to feel 100% better. I hope they feel significantly better, but you have to understand some of these patients may continue with some symptoms. Obviously, your treatment is choice is tailored to individual needs and local expertise, but I do think that flexible endoscopy should be considered when you have a small diverticulum, when you have anatomical barriers, stiff necks, kyphosis, osteophytes, large teeth. Somebody who's had a recurrence, as I just showed you, it, may, it seems like it may be really nice, and high anesthesia risk patients, because I think that this can be done safely without endotracheal intubation, uh, but I guess that also depends on your local expertise. Thank you. Louis, that was terrific. Uh, let me just say that I think that uh, this is a great adjunct. I don't think it's a competition. I've worked with the ENT surgeons. They get these referrals. Very often when they use their instrument called the weirdoscope, they can't get good exposure. A lot of times the patients have kyphosis, they have trismus, they can't get to the point. I think the flexible endoscope plays an important role in this, and I think yes. we need to get involved in this as well. Um, do you have any patients you wouldn't do this on? Yeah, uh, well, we have a patient who's already been treated uh, three times, and, uh, and that patient actually I took a look and has a very small diverticulum. It's very, very thin, very small, and very scarred. I think that person is actually having more of a problem with swallowing rather than anything else, really. This is more common than we believe. It's often ignored. Uh, it's a source of aspiration pneumonia. It's something that we don't pay enough attention to. We need to get involved in this, just Absolutely. like we did in achalasia. This is really analogous to the epiphrenic diverticulum in achalasia. It's almost the same thing. Any comments over there from uh, Dr. Schauer? Uh, we see you, Dr. Schauer. You're, you look pretty good this morning. You have any comments on this? You didn't yeah. think I'd be calling you from Florida, did you? <laughs> You're supposed to be over here, Jeff. You're in the wrong place. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> I think your points are well taken, Jeff. Uh, we, you know, general th surgeons, sometimes we think that uh, we have all the fancy tools and all the great ideas, but we need to uh, take a look at what our colleagues are doing in other areas, ENT and, and uh, gastroenterology, um, and look what they're doing and try to figure out how we can apply those technologies to um, our areas of interest. And this is a good lesson. Absolutely, because we always think that our technology and our techniques are the best, and then we walk into another room and say, oh my goodness, there's something better. Any comments? You don't see this disease very often, huh? How about at Ohio State? Anybody there? Adrian, no, I saw Jeff, you. Thanks. I mean, there were... oh, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. No, I, I, I think one of the things, uh, Jeff Hazy at Ohio State. Oh one of the things God. we need to they be. We need to I be... see you there. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> You've done any we, of these, we need Jeff? to be mindful of too. Is very often when we start to do these things, they lead to new. They need to new instrumentation and new innovations that we haven't yet realized. And uh, we see all of these neat, neat tools and the things that we use there, um, but you know maybe down the road we can get a we can get us a small, very very small, but flexible stapler to do the same thing, in in a fraction of the time. You know, ironically, there was a flexible GIA stapler that was made uh, by Power Med. 
which has now been acquired by Covidian. <laughs> it was used clinically even in the stomach. And it was perfect for this, and now it's been abandoned, and we need to go to the people who bought Covidian and find out where they buried that. So I think that would be extremely <laughs> useful to guide that with a flexible endoscope that's, and that's use it. so, yeah. Okay, I don't want to belabor this anymore. So let's go on, Louis, you have another case? Yes, I'm going to quickly present a second case. Uh, it's a whole, it's a different thing, but uh, briefly, uh, 82 year old female with intermittent hematochesia and melanin, transfusion dependent, gets blood transfusions every few weeks, every few months, has had numerous endoscopies and colonoscopies. Sometimes they see a little bit of blood, sometimes they see nothing. And uh, on video capsule endoscopy study, found a few injectations, fresh blood in the small bowel. So what do we do next? This person is obviously bleeding intermittently, 82 on aspirin, what's next? So I guess it would be called overt GI bleeding, and I think we would call this, you know, mid-GI bleeding, and this is what I want to show you is a, a small bowel dulafoy uh, lesion, which is uh, what this is. Of course, you would consider angiectasia, ulcers. A patient is on aspirin, they can have small so bowel ulcers. what are you using here? What is this, putting this is enteroscopy? A, yes, no, no, it's a double balloon enteroscope. This double is a Fujinon balloon. double balloon enteroscope. This is a... Uh, way beyond ligament arthritis. I think we're about 70, 80 centimeters from the ligament. I like to do underwater endoscopy, as I call it. I actually utilize the US endoscopy velocity irrigator. It allows me to shoot about 100 cc's of water every time I press the, uh, the mechanical pump. And I think it's really helpful for patients who present with GI bleeding. As you saw right there, you saw like a, a, a smoke of uh, blood. You can see the blood actually coming out. Then it stops. I'm trying to uh, uh, rotate the scope around because I know the bleeding is coming where it's coming from. You see a little bit of the blood right there and some clot. And since the instruments come down around the six or seven o'clock position, I have to position it that way to be able to put out my instruments. The problem with doing that is you can see right there that the lesion not only stopped bleeding, but it's very difficult to see which is uh, kind of what dulafoys uh, do. And uh, here we are, again, in irrigating. Uh, with, and I, I, again, I like to go underwater. I think it uh, really uh, enhances the view and definitely helps you figure out where bleeding may be coming from. Uh, you may not see it there. I don't think it, you can see it very well, but at any point, the uh, screen starts becoming a little red. So I know that there's some, some bleeding going on somewhere. It also highlights how difficult it is to position the scope, how difficult it is to find these things. And sometimes our instrumentation is just limited because Everything just has to come out through that little channel, has to point the right way. Um, so um, in, in this one, let me see, it's taking a little long here, but um, here we go. I'm actually uh, going to inject uh, the site, um, and as it turns out, I'm using this to actually probe. There I see a little bit of blood now that I push it behind. It's behind that fold, which also makes it extremely difficult to find the, the bleeding site. And, uh, but after manipulating and moving it around a little bit, I'm seeing more active bleeding. There it is again. Uh, quite active. I already injected, as you can see right here. Actually, you, 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 with epinephrine, you start seeing that everything starts whiting out, and uh, which uh, you know is uh, is appropriate to treat any kind of GI bleed. But for a dulafoy, especially injection alone, is probably not going to be very successful. Um, so here we are again underwater. I've already uh, put a clip here. That clip was actually placed to identify the site for surgery or IR should the person need to go that because I'm finding it very difficult to actually treat this lesion. And I've also tattooed the site just in case. As it turns out, I was able to identify the site. You see the clip uh, being applied. This is a Boston Scientific Resolution clip. And um, um, toying around, it moves. It went beyond. I'm pulling it back. And you're going to see right here in a little bit there's the dual foy, that little red spot that's like nothing right there, that's it. And uh, the clip was applied successfully, the patient stopped bleeding and, uh, and uh, went home, at least, uh, at least for now, it looks like uh, we treated that part of the bleed. Um, so, and, and just to show you very quickly a colonic dual foy lesion, this is something that I did with one of my previous fellows, uh, that we actually um, also uh, published as a video in uh, gastrointestinal endoscopy, you'll see the uh, blood vessel uh, right there. It's a very small vessel, but it's pulsating. It's a dulafoy lesion in the colon, the sigmoid colon. Here we are. Um, we identified. You can see the pulse, the pulsation. This person had also had numerous endoscopies, colonoscopies, nothing uh, with recurrent anemia. And here we go, and we treat this with a, uh, with a clip. Um, actually, we put a few clips. I think initially we put maybe too many clips on, uh, but after this, um, the, uh, the bleeding again stopped. So that's another method of treating these lesions, uh, which are a big problem. We actually published a fairly large series of dulafoids, but the important thing is to note that they're not only in the, in this, in, in, they're everywhere, not only in the stomach and in the small intestine. I think that uh, you make a great point, and the only question I want to ask you, because we want to move along, is 
So if you do capsule endoscopy, does that patient have capsule endoscopy? Where yes. You, did it suggest a bleeding lesion? Somewhere in the small bowel there was blood. That's All right, it. so that was what prompted the double blue. Absolutely, yes. Okay, so that's the order you would go. That's the order I go. And okay. also, uh, depending where you find the lesion, according to the time it was in the small bowel, we elect to go from above or below. All right, great. Lewis, thank, thank you. And thank you enough. Great job. Next, I want to introduce Dr. Ronnie Pimatel, who's going to give us uh, some more fascinating cases. Good morning. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I'm going to move into a more um, mundane but uh, practical uh, topic for uh, gastroenterologists and surgeons alike. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the change of uh, the phase of polypectomy nowadays. Okay, uh, the future ain't what it used to be. We used to do these polypectomies all the time. Nowadays, uh, polypectomies have changed. Uh, lesions have moved from the left to the right colon. Instead of being pedunculated, uh, now we have this flat polyp, very difficult to identify. Most of the time, they are serrated rather than adenomas. And most of the time, these are large, complex, difficult cases that we used to send to surgery most of the time. And nowadays, we, we try to deal with it ourselves. And um, Ginsburg uh, came with the definition, what we call a defined polyp. And these are polyps that are greater than two centimeters. Most of the times are located in the right side. 10% of them will require surgery, and most of the time require piecemeal uh, resection. Let's move into uh, a little video. And, um, so this is a, uh, to make things complicated, this is an 80, this is an 85-year-old retired judge from New York who did invite me to play golf if I ever go to New York, who has chronic atrial fibrillation on Coumadin and a pacemaker and a, uh, uh, a defibrillator, who uh, somebody found this polyp on the rectum, and it was sent to me for removal if I felt it was uh, good to be. So this is in the rectum, and uh, the first thing is this polyp came about 11 o'clock in your screen, and I moved the scope to move it at 6 o'clock. And the first thing I think you need to do with these lesions is to really define the borders and have your scope stable. You cannot tackle this lesion unless you have your scope stable, able to uh, remove it without uh, much handling of the scope. The second thing is to lift them and create a cushion between the superficial and the deeper layers. And the ideal thing is to inject proximal to distal and kind of do a little bit of uh, artwork if you want to lift the polyp in a way that really presents to you uh, in a way that you can resect it. I try to inject the borders or the, uh, of the middle. Uh, don't try to inject too much outside, otherwise you may flatten the lesion, then becomes a problem. We use um, methylene blue, uh, and, and that has few purposes. In this case, I'm using a, a dock snare. It's made by uh, Wilson Cook. It's very nice, uh, monofilament, and it comes very nicely in terms of resecting the polyps in, uh, in the least number of uh, uh, sizes possible. And if you see here, one of the mistakes we do quite often is we don't locate the snare in the same plane as the lesion. And I'm not able to catch the snare first. So I need to flatten the snare and bring the polyp in the same plane of my scope. And then I'll be able to get the snare, uh, the, the polyp around as I want it. And then I close it. We use... Um, endocut polypectomy, nice coagulation without much of a uh, burning, so you prevent transmural burning. And uh, the art of polypectomy is a good communication between you and your nurse, and you need to tap on the, on the pedal slightly and intermittently, and you need to direct your nurse on how to close the snare. And then we take the, the second cut, and we end up with a nice, uh, EMR and a nice muscular layer behind with a blue dye behind it. One of the reasons to use uh, methylene blue, it gives you a very nice reassurance if you have gone through the wall and there's something called a target sign and we'll discuss about that. The next step is to look at the borders and to make sure you have taken most of it. There's a little bit of a thing left to the right that I'm going to take off. There's also the use of AP, APC. I'm going to discuss the role of APC and if it's helpful or not. 
And finally, we have this defect, and I need to close it. We use a resolution, um, Boston Scientific. We, we go from the uh, top and come down, and that allows you to close the defect without the clips interfering with your uh, field of view. If you start from the bottom and top, you may have problems. Uh, another nice feature of this is you can rotate these clips, although they're not designed to it. So one of the things you do is you close it, rotate it uh, clockwise, and it comes in a nice position. And then you, um, you see as you put the clip, the defect closes. So something that really looks very large to begin with closes. We, uh, the Wilson Cooks uh, clips are a little bit larger, uh, but I think that these ones are easier to use. And we finally put a large, uh, the last clip and uh, closes nicely. I think most gastroenterology agree that, you know, a few years ago, a lesion like this would have gone directly to a colorectal surgeon to do a transanal resection, have a nice piece, full thickness. Nowadays, most of the time, we deal with these lesions, not just in the rectum, but in the right colon also. Ronnie, I want to inter I want, while this runs, I want to ask you some questions mm -hmm. about this. Because you uh, are clipping the bed clothes, number one. And the question is, why do you have to clip the bed closed? I have never closed a bed like this. I do them all and leave them open if they're hemostatic. Do you think you have to close this? I think so. I think especially in the right side, as the time goes by, the base of the polyp stretches, and that's what makes them bleed. And I'm sure showing data showing that clipping is necessary. And I'm, I'm a humble gastroenterologist that cannot fix that bleed if they perforate, so the surgeons can go and fix it. I need to beg you guys. I really to never me. have closed it. The other question I have is, we now have two procedures. One is EMR, which you demonstrated with mm -hmm. piecemeal resection, and the other is ESD, where you get an intact, complete specimen. I've heard some people suggest that the ESD will give you a better tumor operation, like you would do surgically, rather than doing a piecemeal resection, particularly if there's invasive uh, lesion there at all. So would you comment on the, 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 when you would select ESD for this lesion versus EMR? I think larger lesions, you, you will go with ESD. Uh, lesions like this, I think up to five centimeters. If you can take them in a piecemeal session, no more than three sessions, I think you are fine and the results are very good. When you're talking about bigger pieces and questionable uh, pathology, you want to go with ESD, that the margins lateral and deep are intact and you can send one piece. All right, any comments? Dr. Adrian Park, I saw you out there somewhere. Do you have any opinions on this? Uh, should you have done uh, just a transrectal uh, excision with a stitch above and pull it down? Dr. Hazy, you have any comments on this? Ohio State? No, I think, you know, as we get better and their instrumentation gets better, the colorectal surgeons will do less and less, and the endoscopists will do more and more. Okay. Are you closing these beds or are you leaving them open? I'm, no, certainly in the right room, no, I wouldn't feel obligated to close it. Um, now, if it were in the right corner, <laughs> I, I probably would. I'll be honest with you. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you a different question, Ronnie. I had a case just recently with a lesion, something like this, underneath the ileocecal valve. And when we have a disadvantage of position underneath the ileocecal valve, and I think Dr. Aram is going to talk about some of this too, uh, sometimes you question whether you left a little bit around the edge, you don't have a good exposure. When would you cons uh, consider consulting a surgeon for a surgical resection rather than going back again and again? One of the predictors of uh, recurrence is ileocecal valve involvement at this type of polyps. And I'm going to go into some of the slides going into when should I refer this patient to a surgeon. Okay. But if I'm not confident that I can tackle the polyp completely in the first go around, I normally send those patients to surgery because those are the patients going to have problems. Two or three procedures and then they're going to have surgery anyway. Right. Okay. okay. So what makes a polypectomy difficult? I think there are three issues. Number one is patient issues. Normally these patients are referred to us. We see them in the clinic. We look at the pictures. Uh, and I normally set up enough time, one hour, if I need to tube them, if I need to do something so they are quiet and I can do my job, I do that. Number two is in this case, quite often these are elderly patients, Plavix, Aspirin, Coumadin. One of the reasons to put clips is I need to put this guy on Coumadin two days after or the same night, so I need to clip them. Comorbidities, I don't want that guy crashing on me then or crashing on me tomorrow. 
And the third thing is, especially if you encounter these polyps at the time of the initial polypectomy, is the patient ready? Have you discussed the risk of perforation, which are very different from a regular polypectomy? And if the patient is ready to go to surgery, something bad happens. The second thing is what Dr. Ponsky was asking is polyp issues, the size, the shape, the location. Can I tackle this properly in one session? If there's any question of submucosal invasion that will increase the risk of perforation and then coming back for a second surgery or second uh, go around. And the third one is your, your, your issues, issues of endoscopy. Do you feel comfortable you can do this? Can you see the polyp completely? But the most important thing that my mentor, Dr. Zuccaro, told me is, can you keep the scope in a position that you can do this nicely? Is your fail of surgery for a surgeon? You need to be comfortable that if bleeding develops, if something develops, perforation develops, you can tackle that. So for me, location, can I see it? Can I keep my scope stable? Can I take it all off? Can I deal with the complications? So the first thing is to mucosal invasion resectability. And this is from Australia, prospective study, seven major Australian centers. Polyps were big. Patients were up there about 70 years of age and mean size of the poly about four. And they look for predictors of resectability, recurrence of adenoma, and the presence of submucosal invasion. And about 90% of the time, they were able to take the polyp in one session. What were the predictors of poor resectability, prior EMR attempt. So if you're referring this patient for, for a therapeutic endoscopy, don't try to take it off if you can't take it off, or don't biopsy it too much. Just leave it alone. And IVC involvement, that's what Dr. Ponsky said. That's a problem. And nowadays, some of the scopes, you can retroflex in the cecum and sometimes makes things easier. Second uh, thing is uh, polyps greater than four centimeters. I think this poly was about five. And the use of APC, and I don't think APC make it worse, and I'll show you a slide, it's probably a marker of a bigger polyp or, or partial resection. And the third thing is the submucosal invasion. If you have the press lesions, if you have what we call a non-granular pattern and a kudo pit pattern 5, uh, or predictors of um, recurrence. Early polyp recurrence, most important things are prior biopsy or intent to resect will increase your risk of recurrence. A non-lifting sign, and uh, Tolga is going to talk a little about that. You inject saline, and things stay stuck in the middle in the size. And polyp size, as it grows from one to greater than three centimeters, your odds ratios go high. And the, the fourth thing is piecemeal resection. If you need to take this polyp in 300 different pieces, the results are not going to be good. Late recurrence, and it's something very practical for all of us. And they look at about 136 cases, long-term follow-up, we're talking 6 to 12 months. And they look at patients of piecemeal resection, and APC was indicated. Early recurrence up to close to 20%, but lay recurrence is about 5%. And the most important predictor of lay recurrence is if in your three months and follow-up endoscopy, if there's no visible adenoma and the biopsies of the bed of the polypectomy is negative, the chances that this polyp is gone is very high at a year later. The use of APC, a lot of people use this to really make a, make a difference. We use APC to burn the borders, and somebody look at this in a scientific way. Paul is greater than 1.5 centimeters, piecemeal resection, and they have two groups. A group that was randomized, and they were visually removed, and a group non-randomized in which there was polyp left. And the Conclusions were that if you have a polyp that is completely removed and you use APC at the borders, APC makes a difference. But if you see that there's polyp left to your eyes and you APC, you're just kidding yourself. So APC is a little bit touch up, but the real, the real job needs to be done by EMR. And that's why APC comes in all these articles as a marker for uh, recurrence. And target sign... Uh, that's why we use uh, methylene blue, and basically you have this target sign in the specimen and in the surgical bed, and it means you just went through the muscular expropia. And somebody look at what is the utility of target sign, and basically the most important thing is that they look at a large polyps, and if you see the target sign in a specimen at the time of surgery, the all perforations were identified at the time of polypectomy, and all of them were treated endoscopically, and no, nobody needed to go to surgery. So it's a very useful thing not to have a patient coming back with a late complication and perforation. Finally, prophylactic clipping, and that's a point Dr. Ponsky brought. 
This is a retrospective study, sessile polyps, and they look at the effect of clipping in bleeding, perforation, or post polypectomy syndrome. They follow them by phone, and they look at intervention on fully clipped, partially clipped, and not clipped at all. And the most important thing is if you don't clip these uh, uh, lesions, the risk of bleeding uh, was much, much higher, 9.7% compared to 1.8%. And the thing in which they looked at risk factors for bleeding were not clipping, proximal distal location to the splenic flexure, and size by 10 millimeters. And finally, does it make sense? And we're discussing about how expensive these clips are. A clip is $150. Average clip per patient in EMR is about 155, three to four clips. You need 12 patients to treat and decrease the bleeding. And total charges to prevent one bleed is about 7,000. But final cost analysis showed that scope admission, transfusion, et cetera, to avoid resection was cost effective. Thanks very much. Great job. Thank you very much. I want to move along next to uh, Dr. Aram. Tolga Aram is going to uh, present about some difficult polyps. While he's getting ready, I, uh, I want to make the point again about using good judgment in selecting the patients to do the EMR or ESD in. Uh, sometimes we fight so hard to take it out, we forget the end result, which you mentioned. You select the patient that should go right to surgery to uh, get the best result. Our ego gets involved because we want to fight the polyp. Hey, Jeff, this is Phil Shower. Can you hear me? Any comments out there from yeah. anyone at any site? Hey, Jeff. Yeah, Phil, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder um, if the speakers could comment on uh, some of these larger, more challenging polyps um, that are borderline between being able to be resected endoscopically or surgically. Is there a role, I haven't heard about the role of combined laparoscopy, where you have the laparoscope, you know, in the abdomen, you know, there in case there's a perforation or to actually facilitate um, the endoscopic uh, resection. Any comments on that? So, so there are going to be a whole a talk on that right now Perfect. by Dr. Aram. <laughs> so you set him up perfectly. <laughs> Thank you for that. We, we didn't plan this beforehand, by the way. Thank you so much for that. Um, but, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about that at the, at the, at the end. Uh, but first, I want to talk to you about many of you may not have heard the term defiant polyp. This is something that we talk quite a bit about in, in gastroenterology. Um, but today I want to introduce the new member to the defined polyp family, the son of the defined polyp, which is the scarred polyp. I know it sounds like a, um, it sounds like a horror movie, but it, it, sometimes it can be when you're doing a polypectomy. So again, uh, thank you, Ronnie, for an outstanding review of this topic. Uh, uh, the defined polyp is the lesion that is not amenable to standard biopsy and polypectomy techniques. So these are polyps that are flat and greater than two centimeters, uh, polyps in difficult positions. They are sometimes partially resected polyps. They are referred for re-resection. Or some believe that any polyp that's referred to a tertiary care center should be called a defined polyp, which is a rather liberal use of the term. And uh, recurrence of a polyp at a previous polypectomy site. This could be considered a defined polyp. The scarred defined polyp, this is the one that really gives us uh, pause quite a bit of time. It is a, can, this can be defined as a non-lifting after submucosal injection, a, a partial polypectomy that caused scarring uh, after cautery was used. Or sometimes what we find is that even a large polyp that hasn't had a, um, a prior intervention can actually have scarring underneath. And this is something that we're finding more and more with these very large polyps that we get that are usually over four centimeters, and we've done polyps up to eight plus centimeters here. Um, these, are, these make for a high risk for, for incomplete resection. They, they make for high risk for palp recurrence. And so what are our options? Traditionally, surgery has been the option, and we've been, as we've been getting more and more uh, uh, confident uh, and uh, with better tools, uh, we've been pushing uh, aggressive mucosal resections uh, uh, endoscopic submucosal uh, dissection. I'm sorry, this should have been an endoscopic submucosal dissection. And, and what we were also just talking about, which is a hybrid approach, which we've termed here uh, with Dr. Rosenthal, uh, the hybrid laparoscopic endoscopic resection. 
So this is a video of a successful EMR with a scar. So uh, as we, uh, you know, when, when a patient comes to see us in the office, vast majority of the referred uh, patients come in with a polyp that was partially attempted to be resected with cautery. And if it's not successful, they come to see us. And, and, and I even have a dot phrase on my, uh, on my epic uh, in, the, in the office where I just put dot EMR, and it puts down saying that previous polypectomy, uh, causes scarring and it's more difficult to remove. And this is what we talk about with all of our patients. But, uh, you know, we're finding that we're able to still remove uh, a good portion of these polyps, even those with prior polypectomy attempts, uh, maybe about 50% of the time or so. This is one that was previously uh, resected. So here we lift it and, and we grab it with the uh, duckbill snare and I push it back and forth to make sure I'm not grabbing too much of the back. And you can see right over here there's scarring. You can see the scarring there, and I've resected this area, and we're cleaning it up, and we're going to do argon plasma coagulation, and uh, we're finding that a vast majority of the time, uh, when they come back in about six months, and we, we re-biopsy these, most of the time there's no residual polyp. With regular EMR, about 25% of the time you can find a residual polypoid, polypoid tissue, even if there was no visible polyp present, so you should always biopsy the scar after the patient comes back. Um, and so this is an example of a successful one, and this is an example of an unsuccessful one where all the polyp around this area has been uh, removed, but uh, no matter what we do, we cannot, we cannot lift up that portion in the center, and that's severely scarred, and this is a patient who actually had not had a polypectomy before, and, regard, and no matter how much you're digging into this area, you're not able to uh, remove it. And this is a uh, patient who had, uh, who was getting actually an endoscopic submucosal dissection. And you can see here that the edges are working very well. You're able to actually, the non scarred portions of the polyp, you're able to move around and cauterize and dissect very easily. I'm taking down some vessels there, and everything is going great. You're, you're thinking you're going to have a great day, and then as you get to the middle, you hit this, and everything is just completely scarred up, and no matter what you're touching, basically you're trying to go millimeter by millimeter trying to get this thing out without causing the perforation. Uh, but it is possible, and we are able to sometimes uh, get these off. It's another example just completely severely scarred and there's no lifting going on whatsoever. This is using a device called the Irby Hybrid Knife where we can actually inject and cut at the same time without exchanging the uh, instruments. Um, so coming back to the uh, hybrid approach, this is a patient where, this is a patient, uh, th this was actually a polyp in a, in a, in a in the close to the third or fourth portion of the duodenum. This was uh, not able to be resected previously after Dr. Rosenthal uh, mobilized the, um, the duodenum, uh, the one portion in the center that was not able to be resected, we found, you can see him pushing with, the, um, with his instrument here, uh, pushing and tenting that area, and the snare is going around it right now. And we're able to close on this and cut through. And afterwards, watching to see if there's a perforation. And in the in six month follow, there was a small focus here, which we removed. And a six month follow up after that in this patient, there was complete. Uh, there was no further adenoma with this tissue there. So this was successful. So this patient did not need a duodenal uh, resection. So the defined scarred polyp makes for a high risk EMR. The the the, the EMR of scarred polyps are possible, and I think should be attempted before surgery. It, this is controversial. There's not much data on this. Um, it's hard to find really good objective evidence to say we should go one way or the other. But again, based on personal experience and, and speaking with others who have tried this, I think that you should at least see how well it lifts. And that's what I tell my patients. If it lifts well, we'll try. If it doesn't lift well, then, um, then this is something that uh, is probably not going to happen endoscopically. You can consider endoscopic submucosal dissection of scarred polyps in the rectum and the stomach. These are thick areas. You're, you're, it's much safer to be adventurous in these areas. And now we have, um, we have devices where we can actually suture if we create holes in these areas. 
and uh, in the rectum and the stomach, I think this should be considered as well. And uh, if none of that is working, then the hybrid approach should be considered for the defined scarred polyps. And this is, uh, and, and you know, we've had cases recently where um, we were not able to even, even pushing from the outside, able to get this uh, whole area. But you know, now we're trying to see if we can ablate these lesions and and survey them. And and if the patient is very against surgery, then th this is an option. But uh, some of those are going for surgery. So, Tolga, for a, pay, a polyp that's very severely scarred, where you use a hybrid approach, and Raul is taking his instrument and pushing it into you, another approach might be to ex have him do a partial wall excision with a linear stapler and get the whole thing out without question. Yeah. I mean, well, uh, and we did so, that actually uh, last week. Yeah. And then well, not I a scarred patient. The, but. the use of surgical technology, once you're there, uh, may get rid of a piece of the wall that may recur anyhow. I think we, we should use each other's technology for the best possible result. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's, been, it's been key for our patients, and I think that's why, as the word uh, has gotten out, that's why uh, more and more patients are coming uh, through the GI office because we're offering these combined approaches. Bill, did you want to add something? Dr. Schauer? Hey, um, yeah, and these combined technologies, again, uh, utilize you know, the best of both worlds. and. Uh, um, you know, can often, uh, and a lot of this judgment can be made at the time of the operation, and sometimes you get a better perspective either laparoscopically or endoscopically. So I think these combined efforts are the way to go for some of these more challenging uh, tumors. Okay. Uh, Tolga, do you have another, or is that? That's it. All right. I have a video that I want to show just to get criticized that I made. Uh, can we show the video that... Uh, that I brought just this morning of the colonic lipoma. So this was a 35-year-old uh, man, and it even has the right logo on it. Here we got it, I'll thank you. From 2003, Phil, when I was still at the clinic. So this is a 4.5 centimeter, clearly a lipoma with a pillow sign, and this is in the transverse colon, and a fairly, uh, not quite pedunculated, a broad base, but it was a definite base. It flipped back and forth. It was causing some intussusception. Dr. Wexner is having a seizure when he's going to see what I'm going to do here. But um, I was young and brave at this time. And uh, for the younger folks in the audience, when we pushed on this with a biopsy forceps, it yep. went in like a pillow. And that's called the pillow sign. And that identifies a lipoma. And so a lipoma is a submucosal, not a mucosal lesion. I was injecting a little bit uh, at the base with some saline. I really don't know if it mattered very much here uh, to inject, but we did it. Uh, couldn't really see the result too well, but uh, it did provide some, uh, in a submucosal lesion, I'm not sure that injection helps a lot. And now we used a snare, a pretty big one, the biggest one we had. Dr. Wexner is having a seizure. Could you get some dilantin here? How am I possibly going to surround this? But watch what happens when we do. Actually, we had an operating room ready. We actually had an operating room ready, and the family knew that perforation was a possibility, a good possibility. So this was all orchestrated and sequenced. So we did get around it at its base. And we used the, the a cautery that I like to use here was even then the Irby. Uh, the Irby allows feedback uh, uh, in terms of impedance of tissue. It's better than uh, some of the other uh, coagulation methods. We took our time and it, we made progress clearly. Uh, and you can see the color change. And you can see the base. And now we've divided it. But there is some fat still at the base. And now we uh, surrounded this with a, a snare and removed it. So the question is, was this a reasonable approach? Should we have done a segmental resection? Uh, this is a lipoma. 
Um, uh, th this procedure depends on the number of Leydig cells that you have. So uh, go look that one up. So uh, any comments, Dr. Wexner? Yeah, I, I think this is a, a great example of skilled endoscopy and where gastroenterology and surgery fuse. Now, depending upon one's skills, and, and you're obviously a master at this, that's a very good way to approach it. I think if somebody's a novice, the kind of hybrid approach might be to do that in the OR, watching with a laparoscope, uh, you know, where you're just looking at it and being sure it's not a full thickness burn, and if you are, to address it at the time, because it's clearly lipoma, it's submucosal, it's benign. Most people, by the time they get to us with lipoma, have for some reason also had a CAT scan, which shows very clearly where it is. Uh, he did too. So you, you know it's submucosal, and if you're competent to do that, that's great. But if not, there's nothing wrong with watching with a, with a laparoscope while you're doing it. Uh, it doesn't add a whole lot, and if there's any issue, you can deal with it at that time. I, I would not uh, want to resect the transverse colon uh, unless I had to for some other reason, uh, like a you know, full thickness perforation or the fact that it wasn't really a lipoma. So I, I do think that's the way to go. And I think the other important point is that there was a broad-based pedicle, that it was not truly a sessile lesion. Any other comments? Bill. Yeah, hey, Jeff. Yeah, so what would uh, be, uh, in your hands, what would be the limit um, of the size of such a lipomatous lesion that you would say, that's probably just too much to handle endoscopically? I think the base size is very important, Phil. It's not the size of the polyp. It's the size of the stalk in the base. So this, I pushed this around quite a bit before I played with it. It's been edited out. The base was less than two centimeters, so that you take it out. If you start to deal with a base that's three centimeters, four centimeters, then you're gathering tissue and inverting it, and I think you're looking for trouble. But even with this one, uh, we had the operating room all set to go for this case, and everybody understood the implications. But I think that uh, Steve's point about having a laparoscope in while you do this, we're going to do that more and more as we do intramural surgery at the pylorus and other places. The laparoscope to observe is a good idea. Now, Jeff. Any um, question, Jeff? Any, any? Just one other comment, uh, Steve. So my intelligence here at the clinic tells me that that patient, you know, 10 years later has come back, and the lipoma is back, and now it's, uh, 2.8 centimeters uh, in, uh, uh, in diameter. So uh, how are you going to handle that, doctor? Well, if it did, I would not do this again because I think that there's scar tissue now in this wall, and this patient would need a segmental resection, I think. But I don't think that uh, this would be handled the same way the second time. W would you try a hybrid so approach, perhaps? Opinion. Yeah, you could try a hybrid approach, but I'm really worried that the uh, lipomas recur wherever they uh, are, even in soft tissue. And if it came back and if it was a, a scarred in the submucosa, I don't think that taking it out endoscopically would work again. Yeah, I, I, I agree, but I also was just curious, Jeff, if there's any role for anything like a detachable snare or, or at the base, anything like that, to try to prophylax against bleeding, just to leave something there. So I think that as we come along, anybody these days might put an endo loop on it and tighten it up and cut beyond it. That's not a bad idea. Once you're done, you're done. Uh, so you're right. Um, but uh, that was just the way we did it. I want to end this now. I want to thank everyone for your participation and encourage you to participate next month when we're going to be from uh, Brazil. And I'll be there. Phil, I'm going to Brazil, and I'll participate with ERCAD. <laughs> so I go where the show is. Okay, Thanks, folks. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Great. Okay.